Awesome, awesome. So we are in week three of this series that we are calling Known. We've been in this three-week series called Known, and our goal in this series is to look deeper below the surface at some things when it comes to our faith. And our, our goal, our purpose of this series is that we want you to know who we are as a church. Um, we want you to know the Jesus that we know, and we want you to know what we're about, and maybe see if you would come alongside with us and partner with us in our mission. So week one, Pastor Jason opened up our series by talking about the Jesus that we know. And the Jesus that we know, he was the Jesus who touched lepers. He was the Jesus who befriended sinners. And so when we do those two things as well, we can therefore expect the third thing to come true, that we will also offend Pharisees like Jesus did. And then last week, Pastor Jason talked about knowing our Jesus who shared and our Jesus who calls us to go fishing with him in unquestioned obedience and absolute abandon. And now this week, I'm bringing week three. So we want to know the Jesus who served. We want to know the Jesus who served, and by doing so, we also want to know service. And so we're about to get going here in just a moment, but um, I would encourage you, go ahead and pull out the Ignite Church app if you have it downloaded. Follow along in the sermon notes there. If you don't yet have the Ignite Church app, it is free to download on iOS or Android, Google Play, wherever. So go ahead and download that Ignite Church app. You can follow along with today's sermon notes there. But let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Father God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for meeting us here in this place this morning. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit filling this place. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you that you are that God that is, you're too good to not believe, Lord. Lord, that you are the God that can can heal the bodies, that can resurrect, that can bring spiritual life where there is death. God, we know that you are the God that does all those things. So God, first and foremost, we just say thank you this morning for that. And God, we want to experience more and more and more of that. So this morning, Lord, help me to have the words to articulate well this hope that we have in you and the way that we are called to live according to this good news of Jesus Christ, God. So I pray that you would speak through me this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would just come through so clearly this morning and that we would each just walk away with whatever you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we get started this morning, I want to ask us a question that will really get the ball rolling for us. And my question is this. If you were told that you had one week left to live, what would you do? If you were told that you had one week left to live, what would you do? Who would you spend that time with? What would you spend that time doing? This is actually the plot of a pretty popular movie called The Bucket List. Has anyone seen The Bucket List here in the house? Really? Five people. Okay, wow. Okay, so I'm really going to have to explain this. you got to go home and watch The Bucket List, okay? It's really not that old. It was uh, made in 2007. It's got Jack Nicholson. It's got Morgan Freeman. Is that ringing any bells now? Maybe? Okay, so 2007, The Bucket List with those two guys. It's about these two older men, right? And each of them lived drastically different lives. So you have Jack Nicholson's character, and he is this wealthy businessman who is the CEO of multiple hospitals. And so he has just this abundance of wealth. He drinks the most expensive coffee every single morning, and he has a bunch of assistants that attend to every need of his, but he's very disconnected from his family, and he has no one in his life that truly cares about him. So that's Jack Nicholson's character. And then you have Morgan Freeman's character, who is about like a polar opposite of Jack Nicholson's character, because Morgan Freeman is this blue-collar mechanic that is just making enough to get by. He's just making ends meet, and he's a, a big, big family man. So two very different men, but both of these men end up in a hospital where they both find out that they have a terminal illness and a diagnosis of just a few uh, months or a few years left to live. So in the hospital, these two men are side by side in these beds, and these two drastically different men, they're bonding over this common experience of their terminal illness, and they start discussing some things they would like to do before they quote-unquote kick the bucket, so they make a bucket list. And so then the rest of this movie is filled with items that they're crossing off of their bucket list. So the first one, we have a picture of this one. They go skydiving, right? That's the first thing they mark off their bucket list. So we have a great picture here of Jack Nicholson skydiving. That's part of the movie. And then another thing on their bucket list was that they wanted to drive race cars around a speedway. So they drive these old muscle cars on a speedway, have the best time with that. Um, They ride on the Great Wall of China. They ride motorcycles there. They visit the Great Pyramids of Giza. They do a whole lot of things, so much more in the movie. So you really have to check it out. So a large part of this movie, guys... It's, of course, it's a comical take on what many, what many of us would fantasize of doing in our last days. 
Like many of us would fantasize of, you know, traveling the world or going to a Super Bowl or seeing the Pirates have a winning season again, right? Many of us would want that on our bucket list. I know I do, and I, I believe it is happening. So, but if we're honest, if we were told that we had just a week left to live, what, what many of us would actually want to do is we'd want to spend that time with significant others. We want to spend that time with spouses. We'd want to spend that time with, you know, good friends that we re- reminisce on the good old times together. We'd want to impart our wisdom to younger people while we still have the chance. And we'd want to make sure that our last days were full of impact and meaningful as much as possible. So I set the stage for us this morning with that question, not because we're going to be talking about our last days. No, that's not what we're doing. But because I think that question sets up well for us to think about the one who was on his last days in his last week left to live. So the passage that we're going to be in this morning, if you want to turn there with me, is John chapter 13. It's John chapter 13. This is a very familiar passage to many of you because this is the passage where Jesus, he serves the disciples by kneeling down to wash their feet. And this story, to set up the story a little bit, this is happening on Holy Week. So Holy Week, we understand, it's the last week of Jesus' earthly life and his earthly ministry. He rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey while people lay down the palm branches. This is what we celebrate every Easter and on Palm Sunday. And he's heading towards the cross. He has just a few days left to live. And then this is where we pick up in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So, with the cross in mind, his last week left of his earthly life, what Jesus chooses to do with his last week left to live, is he chooses to spend this time with the disciples. And he chooses to spend this time to teach them a very, very important lesson in which Jesus will be the object. He will be the example. Now, let me be honest for just a moment at the outset about this story. I think my fear for us this morning is that we know this passage very, very, very well, don't we? Like, we've heard this passage preached before as Jesus washed the feet. We've been in Sunday school where you had the little cutouts and it's been illustrated for us. We remember those days. Like, we've read this story over and over and over again. So we think that we know this and to some degree we're used to this story, right? To some degree we're just used to it. And I believe that we believe that we know everything there is to know about this story and perhaps... I believe that we believe we already know everything there is to know about serving. Like, we know, pastor, that serving is important. We know that it is significant to do it. We know that we should do it. We, we get that, right? And so a lot of us, then we could easily just sit back, we could relax, and we can tune this message out, believing that it's for somebody else. But perhaps, continuing our theme of an iceberg throughout the series, there, maybe there's more beneath the surface in this story for us this morning. Maybe there's something hidden underneath the surface that God has for each and every one of us. So this morning, we want to know the truth of service in God's kingdom because Jesus himself, he knew the value of being a server, he knew the importance of being served, and he knew the significance of what can happen. He knew the impact that was possible when we choose to give our lives in service to others. And so hopefully this morning, we're going to get underneath this story and God is going to illuminate something new for us this morning. And by the power of his Holy Spirit, that's what's going to happen. So point number one for you to write down. What we need to know about service, point number one is that service elevates the server, not the served. Service actually elevates the server, the one serving, not the person that's being served. Continuing on in our story in verse three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and he laid aside his garments He took a towel and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. Again, don't miss this. When I was reading this passage in preparation of this message, this is what spoke to me the loudest. is that Jesus, like surely in this moment, Jesus is stressed out to the max, right? Like, he's got the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders. He knows that he's about to encounter the most brutal form of death imaginable. And yet he chooses to spend that time with his disciples. And he chooses to spend that time serving them. That's truly, truly remarkable. And in doing so, Jesus teaches us this very, very important lesson. You see, we don't read this story, and we don't look at the disciples and say, Wow, how amazing were the disciples 
How amazing were the disciples that Jesus was willing to kneel down and serve them? They must be a pretty big deal. No, 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 no. None of us do that, right? Instead, when we read this story, we look at this story and we think, man, how amazing is Jesus? How amazing is Jesus that Jesus was willing to do this act as humiliating and as outrageous and as appalling as this was, would be. The Son of God, he's kneeling down to wash the disciples' feet. How truly outrageous this is. But listen, in the kingdom of heaven's perspective, it's not humiliating at all. In the kingdom of heaven's perspective, it's not outrageous and it's not appalling because in the kingdom of heaven, service, it elevates the server, not the served. And so Christ is being elevated to greater measure in this act. You see, Jesus is showing an object lesson. He's being an example to the scripture that we know from the Old Testament that God, he opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. I'm gonna say that again for y'all in the back. God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. I'm going to say that again for y'all online. God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. And man, the disciples continually got this wrong all the stinking time, right? Like the disciples, they would argue frequently over which one of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? Like frequently they're arguing and having this debate about like, well, who's going to sit next to Jesus in eternity? Well, whose name is going to be known next to Jesus in eternity? Who's going to be the greatest disciple in the kingdom of heaven? And it's so sad Because usually these arguments that the disciples are having, they come literally right after Jesus had just told them what he was about to do for them. That he was about to give his life as a sacrifice for them. And here they are so worried about one-upping each other to get more status and more power and more authority and more whatever in the kingdom of heaven because they're selfish. And listen, for us this morning, we have to ask the question and examine our hearts, wouldn't we do the same exact thing? Right? Wouldn't we do the same exact thing? thing because just like the disciples oh man we continually get this wrong all the time you see we want a promotion or we want a job title we want that elevated position because we want everyone to look at us and we want people to esteem us and we want people to care about us and respect us when instead what we should do is we should look at the promotion and that title we should look at it as a greater opportunity to serve those under us that should be our perspective We want that leadership position in the church because maybe we do it with selfish motives because maybe we want to feel better about ourselves. But instead, maybe God is allowing you to be a greater leader so you can be a greater servant, right? Sometimes we serve and we only do it because we want people to see us. And we want people to think highly of us. We want that recognition. And so Jesus teaches us this very important principle found in Matthew 23, 11. This is Jesus' answer to his disciples when they had this, this stupid argument. He said, but he who is greatest among you shall be your what, Ignite Church? Shall be your servant. The greatest among you will be your servant. And so get this. This isn't a point, but you can jot this down. The ones that are greatest in the kingdom of heaven are those that take the lowest positions of service. The ones that are greatest in God's kingdom are those that are willing to humble themselves and take the lowest forms of service. And it's never those that are not willing to lift a finger themselves that just want to wield power and authority and whatever on people. It's not those people, no. And if you're serving for for man's praise and man's recognition, then that's the only reward that you will ever get for your service. God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. We had an amazing uh, kickoff to our our Fuse College Young Adult Ministry just a few weeks ago. Um, As I said, I'm the next-gen pastor, but I'm also the Fuse pastor, and so I I think there's a lot to celebrate from that night, honestly. I mean, we were on the lawn um, outside the main student center. We had over 550 students in attendance. You know, over 600 at least kind of popped by and checked out what was going on. Um, We had 225 first-time guests there, and there were multiple, multiple decisions for Christ at that Fuse on the Lawn. So can we just celebrate that, just what God did? It was truly incredible. And so after a service like that on the lawn, people will typically come up to me because I'm the pastor and I'm the guy that, you know, preached the sermon and has the microphone. And they come up to me as if they think I had something to do with this. They come up to me as if I was the one that makes this responsible and was responsible for their experience. But I want you to hear me that on a night like this of Fuse, the role that I play is such a small and insignificant role. It really is. But the people who play the largest roles and really make a fuse on the lawn happen, they're the people who you will never know their names. And that's how it works in the kingdom of heaven. 
So on a fuse on the lawn, like the big deal that night is not the pastor on the stage with the microphone. No, the big deal is the amazing fuse staff that I have. I've got Macy, Re- Macy Weeks, she's our Fuse director. I've got uh, a team of residents, Juby and Justice and Bianca, and they are working behind the scenes leading everything, like literally everything. And then we have an amazing student leadership team that consists of about a dozen or so students, and they are leading all of our student teams. And then we have about 30 plus small group leaders. And listen, the reason that people come back to Fuse is not because of the preaching. It's not that good, okay? And I can say that because I'm the preacher. It's not that good, right? And like the worship, the worship is amazing, but they can listen to Hillsong online. But what they can't get is they can't get community online. So that's why they come to Fuse. And so our small group leaders play such an important role. There's so many volunteers that make a night like that happen. I'm even going to highlight Pastor Chris, okay? Now, Pastor Chris, he's so humble. Like I, I gave him a picture to put up on these screens. He didn't even put the picture in the slides. But Pastor Chris, there's this great picture of him from the lawn where he's got duct tape in true Chris fashion. He's got duct tape, and he's like attaching a, a, a confidence monitor around our tent so the singers can look at the lyrics. And so he's doing that. But Pastor Chris, he was responsible for making like all the tech stuff happen on that Tuesday night. And, you know, you typically see him on stage leading worship, and he's great at that. But, no, Chris played a behind-the-scenes role in making all the production stuff happen. And then there's Josh and Olivia Parrish, and they show up every Tuesday night. They have full-time jobs, but they show up every Tuesday night to make sure that the sound is run and that the tech happens. And then lastly, there's someone really special I want to highlight here. And then there's Timmy. Anybody know Timmy here at the church? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So Timmy... Here's Timmy, the whole like two hours leading up to Fuse, he's holding that sign and he's waving it around at people on the walkway from the main student center. And he's like just waving it at people, inviting everyone he can to Fuse. And then Fuse starts at 8 p.m. And during worship and during the message, like he's not on the lawn, he's still on that walkway and he's talking with people like this, telling them what Fuse is about, telling them who we are and inviting them to come and see. You see, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are the people, and you, you may never know their names, but they're willing to take the lowest positions of service. And man, we get it so wrong all the time because we look at that pastor on the stage. He's the person that's the greatest. No, 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 no. The Timmies are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we've got to flip our perspective. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven, y'all, they're not the people with the largest platforms. They're the people with the most faithful service. So maybe it's time for you this morning to flip your perspective on service. Maybe you need to understand that you need to take that low position of service because Jesus, he knew who he was, and Jesus knew what he was about. He knew his mission, and so because Jesus knew who he was, he was able to take that low form of humility. And so maybe for you, it's time that you step up and you know who you are and you know whose you are, and so then it doesn't matter what you do. Because if our Savior, the King of the world, if our Savior was willing to kneel down and wash feet, then y'all, there should be nothing that I won't do. Amen? And I want you to have that approach as well. If my Savior knelt down to wash dirty, grimy feet and took the form and the posture of a slave, then there should be nothing in all of creation that I'm not willing to do for somebody else. Point number two, write this down. We need to know the truth that being served well is actually an act of service. That being served well by somebody else is actually an act of service in and of itself. Look with me at verse six. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. (laughs) I love Peter's, like, he just 180 here. Then Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my, my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. He's kind of Mike dropping Judas there. So let's talk about Peter for a minute. Peter often gets this bad rap in the Bible, right? Like we love picking on Peter, and I think it's just so easy to do. But I love Peter because Peter was the only one of the disciples willing to say and to do the things that the rest of the disciples were thinking and feeling, right? He's just the only one that's bold enough to actually open his mouth and ask Jesus the questions. So, you know, it it was totally right for Peter to have this response, when you think about it. Because how utterly offensive was it for the God of the universe to kneel down and to become a servant? 
Like, how unheard of was it for any God, you know, to first of all become human, and then second of all, to like tie a towel around their waist, take off their outer garments, and to do this act. Like, no God would ever do that, let alone the one true God, Yahweh. Like, no rabbi would have ever dreamed of doing this in Jesus' day for their students. And so Peter is rightfully saying, Lord, this is not right for you to do. It was so countercultural at that point. But the other disciples, they were just too cowardly to say it. But I love Jesus' response to Peter here. Jesus says, if I do not wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Jesus is saying, I need to do this for you, Peter. I have to serve you in this way. Would you just allow me to do it? You see, sometimes we're like Peter, and we rob people of the blessing of being a blessing to us. You see, we have this false humility sometimes where it's like, I don't want to put anybody out. I don't want to inconvenience somebody. I don't want someone to have to do this for me. But truthfully, in our hearts, if we dig down deep enough, perhaps that's a little bit of pride. And so when we refuse someone's service, we're removing someone's blessing from God. When we refuse someone's service to us, we are removing their blessing from God because God has a blessing for us every single time that we're willing to serve like Jesus. And so sometimes, church, sometimes the greatest way that you can serve others is by letting someone serve you. Acts 20, 35. Paul quotes Jesus. He says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, it is more blessed to what? To give than to what? To receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It is a blessing for people if they can just have the opportunity to serve you. Would you just allow them to do it? I have a story here that can kind of illustrate this, I think, and it's going to be at my expense. Um, you see, I have my wife, Dalen, here. She's with me, and um, she's been my wife for over three years now. We have a little girl on the way coming in six weeks, and so we are pumped about that. You know, new dad world. Yeah, yeah, girl dad. I'm excited about it. Pretty stoked. But uh, so Dale and I, years ago, we had just started dating, right? And it was our first year of ever having dated, and my birthday came up. And this was like the first birthday, okay, with us dating, with us being together. My birthday happened to be the first birthday. And, you know, we didn't really know each other very well, so she didn't know that I'm really bad when it comes to receiving gifts, okay? Like, I'm really, really awful at it. I love gifts. I I love having them. I love the thought that people put into them, but I'm really bad at receiving them. I'm really bad at my reaction, right? Like I never give people the reaction that they want. I'm just, I'm not a very expressive guy. So like I never can really get to that level, right? And so then because I know that my reaction is bad, I start to overthink my reaction, which makes my reaction only that much worse, right? So that, that's just me. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. But Dalen didn't know that because we just started dating. So it was my birthday, and we were hanging up. I'm going to set the scene for us. You know, the day before my birthday, we're hanging out. We had an amazing day, and I thought that was us celebrating my birthday, right? And then my actual birthday rolls around, and uh, little, little did I know that she had snuck into my truck, my old beat-up 95 Chevy. She, yeah, it's not very good, but she snuck into that truck, probably not very hard, um, and she put a bunch of balloons in there and a bunch of really sweet sticky notes all around professing her love for me. Truly remarkable. It's really great, right? To where, like, I couldn't even open my door without balloons falling out. Like, she killed it. She really, really killed it. So then I wake up that morning, and I come bopping out to my truck, right? I'm just, you know, surprised by it. I didn't know at all. And so I open this, and my reaction is way less than what she wanted, right? Like, I don't, I don't know how I reacted. She'll have to tell you this story. I don't know how I reacted, but like it was totally not what she wanted. It was just, I, I just need to show a natural sort of human emotion of thank you, right? That's all, that's all that's being asked of me in that moment. But she looked at my reaction and she thought I hated it. Like she thought I hated the, the gesture in the present and it just did not go well for me at all. And uh, yeah, I'm having to redeem myself for that, right? <laughs> Like, I'm even telling her last night, I was telling her last night, hey, babe, I'm sharing this story at church, and, like, we rehashed it out, and uh, she got angry with me again. Like, (laughs) this is five years later, and, like, she got angry with me again for this whole thing, right? Anyways... I, I love her gifts, but, like, my reaction to the gift was not good. But in that moment, you know what I needed to do? I'm going to eat some crow here. All I needed to do in that moment was just suck up my pride and just be grateful. And just show that I was grateful for the gift that she had given me. I just needed to suck it up and just be grateful. And just allowed her to give me that gift and to have the satisfaction of blessing me. And maybe you can relate to this as well. 
Because maybe you're here and you also have a hard time receiving gifts, right? Maybe you're here and you also have a hard time allowing people to serve you again because you don't want to put anybody out. You, you don't want to do that. But listen, understand that the greatest, in the, if the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are, again, those that serve. And if it's more better to give than to receive, then you need to allow people to serve you and bless you. You need to allow people to have the blessing of being a blessing to you. So my question for you, and this is where we'll get practical for just a moment. How good are you at being served? Like genuinely think about that. Maybe you need to write that down in your sermon notes for today. How well am I at being served? Do I allow people to go above and beyond for me? And do I give people the blessing of being a blessing to me? If the answer to those questions are just no, or you're not very good at service, then here's my challenge to you. This week, someone's going to ask you this question this week in some form or fashion. Someone's going to say, hey, what can I do for you? Or can I help you with anything? And so often, our knee-jerk reaction is, no, I've got it, you're good, you're good, go home, go, no, 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 I'm good, right? But my, my, my pressing question for you is this week, would you just actually stop for a moment and think about this message and think, what can I actually give them to do for me? How can I actually allow them to serve me in this moment? And it's going to be super uncomfortable at first, and I'm right there with you. But over time, I bet if we continually do that and force ourselves to do that, then we can actually get somewhere and be good at allowing people to serve us and being a blessing to us. Our last point, and then we're done. A life of service is the greatest life of significance. A life of service, a life filled with service and serving others, that is the greatest life of significance. Finishing out our scripture this morning, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Remember, if our Savior knelt down to wash feet, then there should be nothing that we won't be willing to do. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you what, Ignite Church? If you do them. Not just if you know these things, not just if you think these things, not just if you think about serving someone, but no, you are blessed if you do them. So this morning, let's just have another raw moment for just a moment. I don't want you to hear this message and think, okay, Ignite Church is preaching this message because Ignite Church needs my service. I don't want you to hear that this morning because I want you to hear that neither Ignite Church nor the kingdom needs you to serve, right? Because God is God and his kingdom is going to advance with or without us. Someone say amen to that. God doesn't need your service. He doesn't need you to serve, but he certainly does invite you to serve. God certainly does want to bless you by being a blessing to others. Look with me to Acts 17, 25. Paul says this, nor is he, God, worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all life, breath and all things. Again, God doesn't need you to serve, but he does invite you. God doesn't need to bless you, but he wants to bless you. And he'll bless you when you choose to be a servant like him. And your life will have the most meaning, the most significance, and the most impact when you choose to live a life of service for others. Let me tie a bow around this message. I'm going to spoil the end of the bucket list movie for you. Um, I do encourage you guys to go watch it, but, you know, it came out in 2007, so I don't feel guilty for spoiling this, okay? You've had 15 years up to this point, okay? So I'm going to spoil it, but you should go watch it. At the end of the movie, Jack Nicholson's character, his cancer goes into remission. But Morgan Freeman's cancer does not go away, and Morgan Freeman ends up passing away from the cancer. And we learned that Jack Nicholson's character actually learned quite a lot from Morgan Freeman's character. He learned what is significant in life and what truly matters in life. Because through this process, they learned that the best parts of life was not, you know, driving the race cars on the track. The best parts of life, the most significant parts of life was not skydiving or going and seeing a bunch of sights. No, the best part of the bucket list that we find in the movie was the relationship that they formed with one another and the lessons that they learned from each other. You see, again, Morgan Freeman, such a big family man, He pushes Jack Nicholson out of his comfort zone to go and reconnect with his daughter. And as unwilling as Jack Nicholson was in the moment, after Morgan Freeman passes, he finally reconnects with his daughter and he learns what truly matters in 
life. I asked you at the beginning, what would you do if you had one week left to live? We might try to fill that time with silly things like skydiving or driving race cars or things like that. We might continue to fill those things with what we truly strive after for in this life that we think is significant. More money and more power and better cars and better houses, better job. But to really live a significant life is to learn the one man's life, Jesus Christ, and to strive to be like him more and more each and every day. So that one day when we do pass on to the next life, we stand before God our Father and we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. So I don't know how much longer you have left to live. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. But what I want you to really grasp this morning and really start to believe is that the way that your life can have the most meaning and the most significant and significance and the most impact in this life and the one to come is by choosing to know Jesus as he was a servant and choosing to be more like Jesus and serving others and giving our lives for others. Knowing the blessing that comes when we serve others, knowing the blessing that we can be when we allow others to serve us and leaving a whole legacy of impact because we chose to be like Jesus and to kneel down and wash each other's feet. Church, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your great example this morning, Lord. God, how unworthy are we for you to kneel down and to wash our feet? God, how countercultural this is. How appalling and outrageous this must have been. God, to see you, the Son of God, who was God and was with God from the beginning, from whom the heavens and the earth were created, yet you knelt down to become a servant for your creation. And Jesus, we just thank you that you are that kind of God. And so, Lord, now I pray that you would help us to be that kind of people. God, that we, that we look for ways to serve one another, that we invent ways of serving one another, that we outdo each other in the way that we serve and love and honor one another. God, let us be that kind of people. And God, I pray that by the way that we serve and that we love one another, God, I pray that the world surrounding us, that they'll look at us doing this and that they'll see and they'll think, man, there's something different about those people and that they'll then strive to know the Savior that we know. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for serving us, God. Help us to serve one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When you came in this morning, you may have noticed under your seat was a communion cup. We're going to spend the last few moments this morning taking communion together. Here at Ignite Church, we practice the, the open practice of communion, which means that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if your life is found in him, you can partake of communion with us together, and we invite you to do so. So Jesus told Peter in this story, if I do not wash you, Peter, you have no part in me. Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And he also told Peter, Peter, what I'm doing for you right now, you don't yet understand it, but one day you will look back and you will understand it. You see, Jesus is being an object lesson in this story in two ways. And the first way is the way that we talked about. He's being an object lesson in how we serve one another. But also in this story, I want you to see the beauty of how Jesus is illustrating that through his death on the cross, he would wash the disciples' sins. That through his blood, he would cleanse them of their iniquities. So this morning, as we look to and as we know the Jesus who serves and cleanses us, let us remember the Jesus who served us ultimately and cleansed us permanently by giving his life for us on the cross. So peel back that first plastic layer and you'll see the wafer there representing his body. It was that night that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he divided it among the disciples and said, take this eat, do this in remembrance of me. And also taking the wine, in our case, the juice. He took it and he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my blood, which has been shed, which has been poured out for you. Now drink 
and do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray and let's reflect one more time. Jesus, we thank you for loving us. Jesus, we are so undeserving.